Let's pay a visit to Mark's True Crime Corner. This is not a good neighborhood. I'm scared. Now, here's your host, Mark Thompson. The queen of True Crime Corner is my other half, Courtney. Nice to see you. It's good to be here. I really like the lighting. Looks no, really good. New Mark. lighting, but yeah. the shot is really close. With the blue. Yeah, thank you. We are good. in code blue behind me. Yeah, yes. it's nice. It's code blue. Mm-hmm. Well, Tony is uh, wonderful, as you know. I know. And uh, he's great. My boyfriend Jefferson Graham yep. came up also. So the yep. two of them together. But you are the love of my life, and you Aww. do have an abiding thank interest you. in true crime. I don't get it personally, but you did <laughs> hook me on this. Yes. It's a series on Netflix mm-hmm. called, what is it? It's it's called American Conspiracy, The Octopus Murders. And it's on Netflix. And we're covering it today because it was trending on Netflix. I think, I still believe it's in the top 10 uh, movies, or I guess I should say limited series uh, that are being streamed. Uh, but we were really interested in this and it's a very long series so i'm i feel a little pressure today to make sure that i do it well give concisely. us a piece of it anyway mm-hmm. yeah um but we're not going to cover everything so um and then anybody who's seen it as we teased it a little bit last week so that we didn't have any spoilers but also anybody that's watching it can of course discuss it as well because i don't I don't necessarily think it sums it all up, right? No, it, I mean, it really leans uh, into this idea of conspiracy theory agree, agree. and never really being able to solve what actually happened. Um, but for those watching, uh, Tony, if you can go to the next visual. So the two filmmakers are Zach and Christian. Uh, Zach's on the left-hand side if you're viewing. He is the filmmaker. He's the director of it. And then Christian is the gentleman on the right. He was a photojournalist for the New York Times. He was living in New York. They actually grew up together in Kentucky. And um, he started on this on this whole conspiracy, I think, in like 2012. And I say that because they've been making this for a very long time. And actually, the Duplass brothers came in and produced this. They also made Wild Wild Country, which I think a lot of people have seen. And yeah, liked. they're terrific. Yeah. Actually, their stuff's really good. So the Octopus Murders, if you go to the next visual... Uh, is really featured around this gentleman named Danny Casolaro. And Danny Casolaro was a writer. Um, He not only wrote for different publications, he had a novel, one novel that he published, but he also um, bought several publications in uh, the computer field in like the early 80s and and mid-80s. And so a friend of his introduced him to a case and that's how he started down what would eventually become the octopus murders he came from a large italian family and they were very close so when danny was allegedly murdered um the family was really quick to say like he he would never have killed himself which was the presumption of the authorities was that um the crime scene or i guess the 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 scene of which they found him looked like a murder or sorry, looked like a suicide. But in fact, the family believed it was a murder. Well, it was a, as I recall, it slashed his wrists um, and was in the bathtub of this yes. uh, hotel room or whatever. Yeah. But there were other things found around him and he, his oh. wrists were slashed 12 times. No, the, the yeah. uh, this is right away. It doesn't look like suicide. His wrists were slashed over and over and over again deep, yeah. with deep slashings. Plus, there was blood all over the bathroom. So all he over clearly the bathroom. tried to get out. He tried to, I mean, it was a. Clearly. And, well, I'm going to get into it a little bit later, but um, there were uh, there were plastic bags that were found under him that they thought were used to immobilize him and suffocate and, and, him. Yeah, and then they him, could right. cut his yeah. wrist 12 times. So the it starts with the introduction of Danny Casolaro. And so, as I mentioned, he was a writer and he was investigating what would become and what he coined the octopus murder. So if you go to the next visual, this is the octopus murders and they lay it out in this visual. I've put, I don't know what you call them, annotations or notes to kind of focus on where I, what I'm gonna talk about, but you can see it's a massive story with a huge network of, uh, almost like tributaries of information and players that all combine to become this octopus murders. But I'm going to focus on uh, Danny, Inslaw and Promise, 
and also what was happening in San Francisco. So if you go to the next visual, Promise was a software that was created by a company called Inslaw um, in, I think, the late 70s, early 80s in Washington, D.C. And if you go to the next uh, visual, it stands for Prosecution Prosecutors Management Information Systems. And this was the first software that was able to connect crimes and suspects and participants and information. And prior to that, the judicial system and the Department of Justice did not have a digital or automated solution. And so this was transformational in how they were able to use it, um, not only in the federal system, but across the country. And so they do a huge, uh, the Department of Justice does a huge contract with Inslaw and their founder and president, and that's a gentleman named Bill Hamilton. And that is Bill Hamilton, if you're watching. And he co-founded this with his wife. And so they have this enormous contract with the Department of Justice and they're working together. And suddenly the Department of Justice, two years into the agreement, which was multiple years, stops paying Bill. And they start to say that he's in breach of contract and effectively he is forced to file chapter 11. So they sort of force him into bankruptcy by not paying him. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. This is our government. Our government. Now he who he is, had a contract with. Who he had a contract with, but he's not, they are not paying their bills. Now, of course they could pay those bills, but uh, they were defending the fact that they said it was a breach of contract. He's actually still listed as the president of INSLA on LinkedIn, apparently. Um, but he has, since what happened to him in the 80s, always said that uh, the government worked to put him into bankruptcy. Well, that this it was seems in fact clear a conspiracy. based on what yeah. we saw anyway, that that is true. So if you go to the next visual. But it's, it's why that is revealed here, why they want to put him to bankruptcy, what was going on there, this guy they had a contract with, and this, things all tie together, the, the killing, this, and other killings, et cetera. Go ahead. Exactly. So they want to put him into bankruptcy because they want promise. The government wants the software of promise. And so it is alleged that they put him into bankruptcy, they st stole the source code of promise, and they actually worked with a gentleman who I'll talk about in a, in a couple minutes named Michael Riconosciuto. And Michael Riconosciuto built a back door into Promise where our government could monitor the use of Promise with international governments and intelligence agencies that they would sell it to. And they could monitor who they were watching and the activity that they were watching. And so this became really the first I don't know what you would call it, digital or um, internet-based spyware. And that uh, was allegedly built by Michael Riconosciuto. Now, you would ask me, how is the October surprise connected to this? Well, I will tell you, Mark. So <laughs> <laughs> there is a, a, a gentleman or man, um, and he was very close to Ronald Reagan, and he worked for Reagan when Reagan uh, was in California, uh, governor of California. and. It is alleged that this man, his name is uh, Brian, he went to Iran with Michael Riconosciuto and they paid the Iranian government $40 million to hold the hostages until after the election to help Reagan get elected. It's unbelievable. And yet it tracks perfectly with what was going on. Exactly. And now you're asking me, I know you're saying, why is Promise involved? Well, Promise was promised to Brian, who was a technology executive. And so effectively, Promise became part of how they paid him for helping with the October surprise. So the proprietary software, the software that yes. was invented by that other guy, Hamilton, who you yes. showed us, that became the thing that they gave Yes, right, that promise. Software. That's what they gave to this guy named Brian. And they couldn't give it to him because it was Hamilton. So that what they did is they drove Hamilton out of business by not paying their bills. Exactly. And exactly. And then he was given this uh, software of promise. Now, Bill Hamilton knows that international intelligence agencies were using it because apparently he got a phone call from France 
asking about the software and it was the French intelligence agency. And he's saying like, I didn't sell this to you. <laughs> and so he knew that at some point this software was being distributed without uh, his participation. Yeah. So that is uh, the first part of the octopus murders. And then promise becomes a part of the story, um, which ends up in the Cabazon Indian Reservation, but also in San Francisco. So if you go down a couple visuals, uh, so here we are. So here we are in this octopus. This is where we're going. So if you go to the next visual, um, yeah, so uh, Dr. John is a man that uh, worked for the US government in the CIA um, in the 70s and 80s. And he was uh, out at the Cabazon Indian Reservation. His name was John Philip Nichols, but everyone called him Dr. John. Um, and he was at the Cabazon, Cabazon Indian Reservation where a lot of things were happening illegally, but part of that was Michael Reconosciuto was actually building that back end of Promise and they were using Promise. Um, he goes on to build a casino and a smoke shop on the uh, Indian uh, reservation, the Cabazon Indian reservation, which I should say only had 26 Cabazon Indian residents at the time. So it was very small, but the land was big and they had, he had promised the Cabazon Indians a spa, a resort, a golf course, all of these things that would bring in money. And while they were building parts of that, not a lot of money was coming into the Indian reservation. And I'm bringing all of this up because there are uh, five murders in this documentary. And so three of those murders occur by allegedly the hands of Dr. John. Um, I would also say that he was allegedly part of MK Ultra. So again, this goes into those tentacles and those tributaries of connection points of other things that were happening, but he is a really, really horrible human being. So if you go to the next visual, this is the death of Fred Alvarez. So this is one of the five deaths that are talked about in the um, in the documentary series. And well, so, Fred Alvarez is the guy who figured out that that Dr. John is a bad dude. Exactly. And, that he's, he was, and, and Fred Alvarez is part of the reservation. He's part of the- He's part of the reservation the and he's Americans on the group. tribal council and right. he's saying this can't happen. Yeah, how come we yeah. have this thing on our reservation that's making all this money. I mean, they're making so much money. Yet so the, much money. Yet the tribe is in debt. We're just told every year by Dr. John yeah. that we're in debt. No, we have investments that haven't been paid off. And yet it was clearly, it was completely and totally corrupt. And Fed Alvarez was about to go, well, he, I think it was- He a, was going to a lawyer to kick to lawyer. Dr. John off of the uh, reservation. And then he is found murdered with two of his friends. So that is where three of the murders happen. Yes. Unreal. Yeah. I mean, Dr. John was manufacturing weapons on this reservation, unbeknownst to the Indian tribe, yes, uh, tribal council. Thank you. I've yeah. forgotten and that. The there Indian, was a whole uh, big residents. weapons yeah. uh, production yeah. thing going on. Yeah. Um, all right. And then uh, on the next visual, I'm going through this. Uh, so we talked about Michael Reconosciuto. Although um, he's a critical character in this. I'd love for people to watch yeah. and then give me your impressions of this Michael Reconosciuto. He's a clearly brilliant, I mean, genius. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, a lot going on there, and you have trouble a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I mean, I found he him is... believable. Didn't you find him very believable? I found him believable. I I question this haircut, if I'm being honest. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> that that's a tough one for me. But I thought in general he was very believable, and actually that goes to my next visual really quickly. So he was very active in San Francisco in the late '60s. Right. Um, he went to school at Stanford. He was a genius. I mean, it's on. Absolutely. He was genius, an absolute yeah. genius. He was building systems when he was 10 years old and 14 years old. Um, but I think he studied at Stanford when he was 16. And um, he used to hang out at the Strait Theater in the Haight. Um, and he actually brought one of his lasers from Stanford to be part of this first show that happened um, in 1966 when there was a poetry read uh, which was in complementary to uh, the Warlocks music. And so he was really active in and around um, San Francisco. And that's where he found his business partner. And his business partner 
is the fourth murder that's featured in this documentary. And his name is Paul Maraska. And so Paul Maraska is killed in 1982 and he is um, tortured in this murder. Now he had a condominium on Kearney Street near Telegraph Hill, which you all will know it, where that is. And Not I far from KTO. don't know where that is, but um, he is killed. And if you go to the next slide, this is a little graphic, but this is actually how he was killed. And as I mentioned, he was tortured. They used a tortured system um, that was um, often used by intelligence groups, international intelligence groups. And so he's murdered and it is alleged that, and this brings us back to Cabazon, the Cabazon Casino had gone bankrupt. Uh, Dr. John and his um, collaborators were in a lot of trouble. And so they murdered Paul Morasco because he had billions of dollars in offshore accounts. And so that is effectively why it is alleged that they murdered him, but he was definitely murdered. And he was the business partner of Michael Reconosciuto. And he was murdered by a man named Philip Arthur Thompson. And Philip Arthur Thompson was a serial killer in San Francisco in the 60s and 70s. And he got off almost every time. This is another is in a, in a an absolute uh, panoply of amazing. This is one of the most outrageous, amazing aspects to the story. I mean, it's just so shocking. Explain what happened. He was busted over and over and over for these horrible, heinous things that he did. He was busted over and over and over for murders, rapes, robberies, and I mean, um, imagine that all assaults. over San Francisco. This yeah. guy, they just keep they keep nailing him, and then nothing happens. He keeps getting out. He keeps getting out. And he was helping the FBI. It is alleged that he was helping the FBI and the FBI was getting him out of all of these uh, crimes. Of, mm -hmm. of, of, of coming to of being brought to justice. In fact, if you look at the police report and you look at the file on him, it actually says government informant or yeah. government intervention, something like yeah. that. Yeah, government came in and excused him of all, um, yeah. yeah. So it's, criminal liability. I mean, yeah. this story is so chock full of guys like this. That's how you know it goes all the way to the top of government. All the way to the top. And so the FBI is interfering with any prosecution against, allegedly against Philip Arthur Thompson. And so he actually does, he, he passes away in 2020 at 75 from what they believe is natural causes. Um, but he's hired, they actually have lunch at that Italian restaurant that's at the corner that oh. oversees um, Paul Marasco's uh, condominium. Uh, uh, Kim, I, uh, it's- I can't um, remember it, but anyway. So Vanessi's? Vanessi's, yeah, they have Vanessi's, lunch at Vanessi's. Yeah, in North Beach. And they basically say, that's where he lives. We need you to t murder him. Um, and then they took his money. So that is how San Francisco is connected to this story. It's really quite you, extraordinary. Well, so the last part of this is the Danny Casalero, and I'll quickly touch on that. Danny Casalero is found uh, dead in his hotel room in 1982, uh, August 10th, 1982. He had gone to Martinsburg, West Virginia, uh, allegedly to meet with a source. And that source was sort of that last part of this entire conspiracy that had unraveled over the course of a year and a half when he started to research this. And so he goes to the Sheraton in Martinsburg, West Virginia, and he's seen around town. He's seen at uh, convenience stores. He's seen at, I think, a Pizza Hut. He's seen eating and drinking and looking like he's waiting for somebody. Um, but I don't know if he's necessarily seen with a lot of other people. He carried around his entire notebook and all of his notes in a brown attache or briefcase. So like kind of notoriously, that was always with him. Um, but he checks into the hotel, the Sheraton, he's in room 517. And he's last seen entering that room, I think at like 10 o'clock on August 9th. And actually his next door neighbor sees another different man enter that room. And she wrote an affidavit swearing to see this a man with dark hair, kind of stocky build, who went into the room with a key, um, but she she had not seen Danny. She had only seen this man enter the room with dark hair, kind of stocky, and um, that's clearly not Danny. And so Danny is found um, dead 
on the morning of uh, actually it was noon, uh, August 10th, 1982. He is found in the bathtub. He has eight uh, wrist cut cut wrists or slit wrists. Um, and then he uh, he has slit eight times. He has four times his wrist is slit on the on the right hand side or his right hand. And actually, it was so deep that it cut the tenon. So well, that, that, uh, mm -hmm. the reason that's important is that they were sort of suggesting it would be impossible for him to have cut uh, continue to cut once he's cut the tendon. Exactly. Your arm just goes. Yeah, it's a. And it, there's, it, he clearly was was murdered. Yeah, and there's blood all over the bathroom, and there's plastic bags found under Dandy, what they think was used to. Um, uh, uh, you know, make it, make it so that they can yeah, yeah, asphyxiate it. Yeah. Um, and then uh, when the police come, his attache or his briefcase is not found. He's embalmed immediately and the family is not notified of his murder for two days. And so a lot of people believe that Danny was murdered and did not commit suicide. He wrote a very short, short suicide note. Um, it's really directed to his son and uh, there is no signature on it. And so they continue to look into the death of Danny Casalero. And actually, there's a mention of his death, I think, in some of the federal notes around Inslaw and uh, Promise. Yeah. Un unreal. It's, it's unreal. A, it's, it's really spectacular. And it I, goes up to the, the, the highest levels of government. I mean, I include the president of the United States on this one. Yeah. I think it's and, you know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist guy, but as I always say, uh, you know, just because someone's a conspiracy theorist doesn't mean that they're not telling you about a real conspiracy. I mean, I think this is, I think they show their math on this, uh, in this series, as you've given us a little glimpse of. Yeah, it's, I, it's very hard to do this story and the family's justice because we don't have a lot of time. But if you haven't seen the, the limited series, I, and you're interested in this, I encourage you to watch it because it was a really interesting and well done, um, uh, peace. So I thank you for being here today, <laughs> Courtney. And sorry, for was that too long? This. Yeah. No, it's great. We're just a little <laughs> bit late, but I, I love it. Hi, it's Mark. And I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell. You'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.